Hey folks, and welcome back. For those of you new here, my name is Megan, and I live on 1.5 acres in southwest New Mexico in the Chihuahuan Desert. Today I'm going to be going over my favorite vegetable varieties and probably a couple flowers too um, that have either proven to me year after year that they can grow in my climate or have just performed excellently in one season and I want to share them with you. Now this video is about three years in the making, not because I was putting it off or anything, but several of these varieties I have grown since the beginning and they have continuously performed well despite drought, which is all the time here in the desert, and extreme heat during the summers. So I am excited to share these with you. These are by no means an end all be all to the vegetables that you guys should be looking towards if you live in a climate similar to mine, but definitely something to consider because I have tried a lot of seeds. <laughs> I buy seeds every year and I have run the gamut on plants that I thought would grow in my extremely hot and dry environment and then just did not work well. So these varieties I'm going to give you today are excellent and have proven themselves to me and produce food for me all summer long, which is which is really the hardest season we've got here is the summertime. So most of these plants are going to be summer-based plants, although I do have a couple brassicas in here, like cauliflower and broccoli that have performed well for me through the summer slash winter. Um, but most of these are gonna be summer heat-loving plants. So let me just preface this by saying this is not a seed haul. I'm actually gonna be doing a seed haul either in the next video or the video after. I'm waiting on one last order to come in. I'm so excited. Um, and then I will be doing an official 2024 garden seed haul for you guys then. This is just a summary of various plants that I've grown in the past. I already have all of these seed packets. They're all open because I've used them. Um, and then I'll probably at the end go over a few seed companies that will provide for you guys either heat adapted or desert adapted seeds. There are a few that are local to the Southwest and I highly recommend you visiting their website. Um, not only just to buy seeds, obviously, <laughs> but to learn more about growing in a desert environment, which can be extremely tricky. <laughs> this particular cauliflower is called the Rober cauliflower. I have only ever purchased it from Baker Creek and this packet of seeds is from 2022 uh, and I believe the 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 one I had before it was from 2020. The brassica seeds will last a few years. I'm not worried about buying a new packet every year but this is a cauliflower that I have grown every season since the first year I lived on this property and it has performed not only um, through the heat because I've tried different plantings. I've tried planting earlier in the summer where it was really hot and then later in the fall where it ended up going through some cold snaps. Although cauliflower itself does not do super well in freezing temperatures, just because this portion of the cauliflower, the part that you eat, is susceptible to being frozen and then it gets mushy and gross. Um, this, this particular variety of cauliflower has performed well across the board. Um, heat and cold lasted as long as possible during the winter months but um, there aren't many cauliflowers you're gonna be able to find around that can last through significant freeze. So I'm not expecting it just because it's super hardy and really awesome to last through the freeze. Cauliflower's not meant to do that. <laughs> but Rober cauliflower, highly recommend. I grow it every year. I even grew three other cauliflower types in my garden last year. This was the only one <laughs> that performed well and it has every winter since I moved here. So I highly recommend that one. We'll just keep with the theme of fall and winter vegetables and I'll move on to cabbage. And what I have here is an early Jersey Wakefield cabbage. Now this cabbage is a pretty popular variety and very, very quick growing. I believe from, from transplant it's got like 55 days to maturity or something, which is, which is really low for an entire head of cabbage. 
Granted, this is not a storage type cabbage. And it, for those of you that don't know, a storage type cabbage is gonna have like be really, really dense, heavy heads. And when you cut it down the half, there's, there's almost no space in between each layer. Those are storage cabbages. They're also good for sauerkraut, et cetera, et cetera. Early Jersey Wakefield is not a storage cabbage. It has very loose wrapping heads, which means there's a lot of air in between. It's, it can still get to a nice big size and be dense and heavier, but it's gonna have a lot of air in the spaces between its leaves. So it just doesn't last as long in storage as a particular storage variety would. Now this one has performed well for me being transplanted in the hotter summer temperatures um, versus having to just grow cabbage during the winter months. And one of the reasons that maybe, I mean, this is, this is a very versatile variety anyways, but because it's got such a short growing time, 55 days from transplant, that's you know a month and a half from when you put your start outside in the ground, which is amazingly fast. But because of its speed, you can plant in a small window of time that you have ideal temperature for something like a cabbage, which is cooler temperatures, but not completely freezing and not in the middle of summer. So if you are in a place where you have a really short growing season or really hot summers and really cold winters and you just have that small sweet spot of fall to grow a lot of plants, I highly recommend early Jersey Wakefield as a variety for you in the way of cabbages. The next brassica I have is broccoli. And I do have several varieties of broccoli that I like. I am trying to stick to one <laughs> um, variety per type of plant today, just to keep the list down. Um, so I picked this one. This is one that I've grown every year. It's called De Quicho broccoli. I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> but this broccoli does pretty darn well um, growing. Like when I transplant out my broccolis, they're usually late July, mid-August, early August, and we're still getting well into the 90 degrees <laughs> in those months. And this has continually performed excellently for me. And it handles temperature fluctuations very well. These will grow all the way through the fall and enter the winter. And where I live in the high desert, we have pretty extreme temperature fluctuations from day to night. So it could be 70 or 80 in the fall during the day and then drop down to the 30s at night, which is, is pretty extreme and can be pretty hard on a lot of plants. This one just keeps on trucking, performs well. It gives you a pretty medium sized central head. And then once you harvest that central head, it does put out quite a few offshoots just smaller little florets that you can pick off for a small dinner or something. So I highly recommend that variety of broccoli. And as my last sort of fall-ish winter crop, um, because we do grow onions over the winter here in the desert southwest, uh, it's recommended that we plant onions around October, November and harvest in the spring, usually around May. This is one of the varieties commonly grown here in my area, the Texas Early Grano Onion. I didn't grow onions the first year I moved here in 2020, but I did the following year, and this was the seed packet that I got. Um, I start all of my onions from seed, either directly sown in the beds, or I grow them in a flat in here, and then transplant them outside uh, in October, November. But this has grown excellently for me every single year that I've grown it. I have tried other onion varieties. I do not remember the other yellow onion variety I tried, but I also tried a red variety um, that did not perform as well as this Texas Early Grano did. I have not grown a ton of varieties, so take my words with a grain of salt. <laughs> I don't just buy tens of packets of onions and then uh, try a different one each year. It, it doesn't work like that. I do like to, for the most part, stick to tried and true plants because I know I'll get a harvest and my climate is unpredictable enough that I would prefer to just have food <laughs> rather than try a lot of different things all the time. Um, but also, one quick word on onions, depending on where you live in the United States, 
you may have to look at the variety that will best suit your area. There are three different types of varieties of onions. They're called the short day onions, intermediate day, which kinds of falls like halfway between long and short, and then long day variety onions. That is going to depend on where in the United States you are located. So definitely look that up before you go and buy onions. I require, because we are so low in the United States and closer to the equator, I require short day onions, um, which will bulb up at a shorter day length than other varieties because we don't get super long days during our summer months here. So definitely look that up. If I had tried to grow a long day onion, it probably wouldn't even bulb up where I am at because long day onions will usually require 14 days. I mean, 14 hours of sunlight, if I have that correct. I think I have that correct. 14 hours of sunlight to bulb up. And those are gonna be in the Northern states. So depending on where you live, look up what variety of onion will do best in your area to make sure you have success from the get go. <laughs> and then from then on, look at the varieties that you have within that window of onions you can buy. And quickly moving on to our summer plants, I have squash right here and I have two particular varieties of squash that I enjoy. One of these, a summer squash, it is called Ron Denise. I have grown this consistently every year since I moved here and I absolutely love this squash. It's soft and the taste is very subtle like a zucchini, um, but it's this perfect little round shape and it like fits in the palm of your hand and it's an absolutely perfect single serving squash that you can either cut up and saute like a zucchini or you can carve out the middle and serve a stuffed squash. It's absolutely perfect. It does well in the heat. Um, I, I really love this one. I, there aren't a whole lot of squashes. There are some, um, but there aren't a whole lot of squash that don't love sun and heat. Most of them love to be out sprawled in the sunlight. They can tolerate quite a bit of heat. This one has always done well for me. And the second one, which is both, this can either be used young, like a summer squash, or let to mature on the vine, like a winter squash and harden up, is the tromboncino. Now, I do not have years uh, of growing the tromboncino squash to say that this works for me every time, but I did grow this last year for the first time, and it was amazing. The plant just went crazy. I had vines all over the garden, and the squash has got to be huge, and I would pick off small ones, take them in, eat them like zucchini. It was great. I absolutely love this plant. I do have a terrible, terrible, terrible time with squash bugs, <laughs> um, which is partly why I don't, I don't have, I have tons of squash seed varieties. I never harvest a whole ton of squash later into the season um, because of my terrible squash bug problem. I really want to, get better about picking off squash bugs this year. It is a very daunting task when you do it every day by yourself in the garden. Um, but the Traumancino, surprisingly enough, is a little bit more resistant to squash bugs than other varieties. So if you also have a problem with squash bugs, there was one huge sprawling one I had last year that just kept shooting out squash for me. It was absolutely great. When, my, when the squash bugs had taken out the rest of my squash in my in-ground bed, this Trombancino had tons of bugs all over it and just kept on trucking for a little while. It eventually died, <laughs> but it lasted longer than most, um, which is great for me. I will take whatever I can get when it comes to squash bugs because I know how absolutely difficult they can be to mitigate if you are or an organic gardener because there's no organic pesticide you can use on those guys. It's, it's all manual labor. <laughs> you have to pick them off, but Trombancino, highly recommend as both um, just a very, very tolerant squash variety and more tolerant of squash bugs than most. Next on this list um, is cucumbers, but not technically. <laughs> I have a really tough time growing cucumbers here in the desert. I Well, not just in the desert, but in my garden, especially I have a really terrible roly-poly problem, which Last year I learned I could help mitigate with the use of organic spinosad. Um, but 
Nonetheless, I still have a pretty bad roly-poly problem and so a lot of the seeds that I try and direct sow, like cucumbers, don't make it because they get eaten off um, by the roly-polies at the ground. And then our spring here isn't really a spring. It just, it's one day it's freezing at night and then the next day it's like 90 degrees during the day. So it gets really hot and windy really fast in the spring. Spring is one of our worst seasons. It's extremely, extremely windy. It's dry. We have almost no rain in the spring and, it, and it's just really hot. So I have a tough time growing cucumbers because they don't really love super hot environments and it just makes them really bitter. So even if I do have successful cucumber plants, which I have in the past, the fruit that itself isn't super tasty. But I do have the Armenian cucumber, which is technically not a cucumber. <laughs> this is actually a melon, but picked young enough from the vine. It absolutely 100% tastes like a cucumber. I use them as cucumbers and has the added benefit of letting, if you let it grow to its full large size and they, they get huge, absolutely enormous, <laughs> um, then you can eat it like a melon. Cut it in half, take the seeds out of the middle and it's a bit like a cross between a honeydew melon and a cucumber. It still retains some of that cucumber flavor but it's just a lot more watery and soft like a melon when you let it ripen to its full size. I prefer to use them as cucumbers, so I will use them in the place of cucumbers all summer long, make pickles with them. Granted, they don't have a super dark exterior like a cucumber. Appearance doesn't matter that much to me. And when you can't grow cucumbers to save your life, this tiny little cucumber-like melon is a godsend. <laughs> so if you have trouble growing cucumbers wherever you're at, I highly recommend the Armenian cucumber. It is a huge plant though, be aware of that. It goes everywhere, it likes to climb. I like to trellis mine, get it off the ground, but otherwise it would just be enormous. These runners go everywhere. It's an inc incredibly prolific plant and I cannot recommend it enough. Armenian cucumber, try it. All right, the next thing I'm gonna talk about are beans. And there are two very specific types of beans. Um, these are plants that belong in the same genus as peas and beans, but they are not like your typical common bean, like a pinto bean that you would see on store shelves. And they are cowpeas and asparagus beans. One particular variety of cowpea that I have here is the California black eye number no. five. Now, although they're called cowpeas, they are actually in the same genus as beans. Um, they're also called southern peas, black eyed peas, crowder peas, field peas. They have tons of names. But cowpeas in general produce better in higher heat, humidity, and drier conditions than other beans. And honest to God, cowpeas and asparagus beans are the, possibly the only beans I have had success with my last three years growing beans over the summer. Now asparagus beans are these really, really long, skinny beans um, that can grow up to like two feet long. These things are long and skinny and they're kind of they're kind of waxy or rubbery. So they're really, really best cooked sauteed. Um, they're also called Chinese noodle beans. They're often used in like sautés or stir fries, things like that. Or you can eat them fresh. You do not want to eat the dried beans off of these like you would a black eyed pea. Um, but it's great if you have both because you can eat your asparagus beans as a green bean and then use your black eyed peas as a dried bean. Um, but I have really, really, really only had success with these two types of beans. There are multiple varieties of cowpeas that you can look up. I've also grown the pink eye purple hole cowpea, which did okay for me last year, though not as well as this California black eye number five. This has been my most successful cowpea that I've grown for the past three years. Um, but all of the cowpeas are going to be better than other beans in heat, humidity, and dry conditions. The same with these asparagus beans. And these guys just keep, just keep flowering and fruiting all the way until frost. They go forever. <laughs> They're, it's absolutely great what these asparagus beans are good for. 
Um, but if you've had bad luck, I've, I've tried to grow for, what, what was it? Two or, th was this my third year or second year in a row? I tried to grow the rattlesnake pole beans and they would do well. They would grow, they would trellis all the way up until like July. And we started hist hitting consistently over 95 every day and they would just shrivel up and die. <laughs> so um, if you don't have a very long cool season to grow beans to let them mature um, before they peter out in the really hot summer heat, I highly recommend trying cow peas, asparagus beans, or both if you're feeling frisky. <laughs> the next two types of plants I'm gonna talk about, I don't really have a favorite for a desert garden because honestly, these plants do well no matter the heat or the humidity and um, they're just commonly grown in very hot places. So first one is okra. What I have right here is a bur burgundy okra. In particular, I grew this last year. I enjoyed it, but I've never really had a bad time with okra. Okra loves the heat. It is one of those plants that um, will actually do very poorly in cool conditions and will grow and thrive in hot conditions. So I don't know if you could really go wrong with a specific type of okra. I haven't tried them all, um, but I liked this burgundy one. <laughs> if you wanna try an okra, I recommend it. It's pretty good. The Clemson Spineless is also a pretty good variety that I've tried. The Clemson Spineless seems to stay softer a little bit longer on the plant than other varieties I have tried. Okra does grow really quickly, the pods do. So you could walk out one morning and see a really, really tiny little pod and then not pick it because you're like, oh, I'll just let it get bigger. And then you go out that evening and it's too big and it's, it's hard and crunchy and you don't want to eat it. The Clemson Spineless seemed to do a little bit better job of staying soft when I missed a harvest than other ones, but honestly, any okra will do in this climate. <laughs> it's, it's really all semantics past that point. So if you have a particular okra you love and you're growing in a hot climate, please leave a comment down below and let me know. I'm always down to try new things. I'm not too savvy on types of okra or if they taste better than the other. So I am always up to hear your recommendations. <laughs> and the next one, my favorite plant to grow is peppers. You can't go wrong with peppers in the heat. Whether you live in the humid south or the desert south, peppers are going to thrive. They love it when it's hot, as long as you keep them watered. Now there are peppers that you can purchase, especially from you know a desert adapted seed company that will be more tolerable to drought conditions, but peppers in general just love the heat. They don't love being dehydrated. <laughs> So that is something to be aware of if you're trying to dry farm or grow someplace where you can only irrigate every so often. Be aware of that. But if it's just heat tolerance you're looking for, any type of pepper will do. I don't have a specific recommendation for peppers that do better than the others in heat. I grow them all. I've got more than 30 packets of peppers in my seed collection that I've grown every year and they just all do wonderful for me. But two of my favorites are going to be the Pimiento de Padron. I have talked about this ad nauseum in previous seed videos and planting videos. This is one of my favorite hot peppers to grow. It's great um, either stir fried or just put into recipes that you're cooking or dehydrated and used as a, like a red pepper powder or a green pepper powder because they're good both ways. Um, they're very thin walled. They're not thick walled like a jalapeno, but the flavor and the heat is excellent and they're very, very prolific. The second one is the shishito pepper, which I'm sure most people are going to be familiar with. It's not a hot pepper and it's commonly used just sauteed with some oil or butter, salt and pepper as an appetizer. This is a really, really good pepper as well. I grow both of these every year and they have never steered me wrong. And last but not least, I have tomatoes and I have several here. Um, I'm gonna go over two varieties that I've grown every year since the first year of my garden. 
And those two are going to be the German Pink, and because I'm out of seed packets, the Mexico Midget, which is a, a cherry tomato. Both of these <laughs> perform extremely well in heat. Um, the Mexico Midget I have found will absolutely keep putting up blossoms in the middle of summer. A lot of times tomatoes will not set blossoms over 90 degrees, which is basically all of May, June, July, and August <laughs> here in the desert for me. Um, but the Mexico Midget has continually every year set blossoms in the middle of summer and kept giving me fruit. They may taste a little, they may taste not as sweet in the middle of the summer when they're coming out, but the plant keeps kicking and that is what I like to see. So I highly recommend the Mexico Midget as a cherry tomato. This German Pink is a little bit more intolerant of the heat, but it has still performed year after year for me where other tomato varieties have failed. So I give this five stars as well. I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a big old slicer and it is so sweet. <laughs> it's an absolutely delicious slicer tomato. Now these three, these three tomato varieties, I do not have a ton of experience with. I grew them for the first time last year, but they did so dang good that I'm, I'm gonna pass it along to you. The first one is the Giant Crimson. And this, I don't know if it's still exclusively from M.I. Gardener, um, but M.I. Gardener did find and make these seeds available to the public. They're very, very old seeds that were found. There's a whole story about it. You can look it up. I was a little skeptical about this tomato because M.I. Gardener is obviously from Michigan, which is a vastly different climate than me. But these tomatoes grew so well and kept producing in the middle of summer for me last year. I was completely blown away um, with how good these were. Now, I will tell you that as the summer went on, the fruits got smaller. So right at the beginning of the spring, some of the first fruit sets I had were huge. And I understood why it was called the giant crimson. <laughs> but later on in the summer with the heat and the stress it was putting on the plants, they, the, the tomatoes that came out were smaller. They were still coming out though when a lot of my other tomatoes had stopped producing. So I don't care what size they are, if it's the only plant giving me tomatoes, I'm gonna take it. And these next two are hybrids from Johnny Seeds that were both specifically bred to be more heat tolerant and more able to set fruit in very hot conditions. And they both performed really well for me. They're gonna be called the Grand Marshall F1 Hybrid and the Estiva Tomato. It's hybrid as well. Um, you're more than welcome to take a look back at my 2023 garden tours to check out how these tomatoes did. The Grand Marshall specifically this is a determinant tomato. So it's a bush tomato. It's gonna have a tendency to put out a lot of fruit at once and then taper off in its production instead of you know, producing a lot over a longer period. Um, but this Grand Marshall tomato was so weird last year. It threw out a bunch of fruit at the beginning of the summer and I was like, okay, this was its, this was its last hoorah. This is great. I got a ton of tomatoes. And then it, they kind of like, looked like they were dying, didn't really produce much. And then all of a sudden in the fall, it went out and set out a ton more blossoms. And by the end of the fall, when all of my tomatoes had already fallen to disease and were dead, I was getting tomatoes, brand new, fresh, delicious tomatoes off of this Grand Marshall determinant type. It was amazing. I. I'm absolutely growing this again this year. So I highly recommend Grand Marshall F1 Hybrid. It is a determinant, so you don't have to, you know, do really tall staking. It's not going to keep growing up and up for the duration of the season. But for some reason, it kept producing more and more for the duration of the season last year for me. So that is, that is an awesome tomato. I'm very excited to keep trying it, keep experimenting with it over the next few years and see where it takes me. That is it for my seeds. 
quite a few. I tried to give you at least one from every variety that I grow. Um, what I didn't list here, I don't have any pea varieties like English sweet peas, those kinds of peas, because I can't grow them. <laughs> it's been documented over the years how much I can't grow them. <laughs> but um, I don't have any pea varieties for you. Garlic, there were tons of great garlic varieties out there and at least in my area, they're grown over the winter. So my climate, my heat or drought doesn't really affect it that much. Um, they're dormant for a large part of the winter and then come back in the spring. So I don't have any specific garlic varieties for you. I try new ones every year and they're all delicious. Um, melon varieties. First and foremost, the Armenian cucumber that I showed you guys is technically a melon. But other than that, I haven't successfully grown melons here, which is weird, I know. I have tried to grow several different kinds of watermelons, including um, more heat tolerant and desert adapted varieties. One in particular that has produced at least one or two melons for me was called the Desert King watermelon. I think I found those seeds at Baker Creek. Um, but I, I, they just tend to fall to the heat or I'm not planting them right. I'm not really sure what's going on. I'm also not too worried about it. As much as I love watermelon or cantaloupe or honeydew as much as the next person, we don't often buy it in the store. Uh, so if it doesn't come to fruition, if I don't get gobs and gobs of watermelon by the end of the season, we're not really suffering um, because it's just not something that we regularly eat. And I would prefer for something that we do regularly eat, like squash, to take up the place of the watermelon if it's if it's not gonna produce me anything. So I don't have any watermelon varieties for you or melons or any sort of thing like that. Although every year I am getting new varieties and trying them <laughs> to see if I can see what find what works here. Um, Cause I would like to grow some, I just, I'll just keep having to try it out. And, and sometimes that's, that's what you gotta do when you live in a climate that can be extreme or fluctuating. Sometimes you're just gonna have to test things out for yourself, but it can be fun. So we'll see what, what I'm doing this year. I've got a few seed packets that I'm excited to show you guys in regards to plants that I don't often have success with. Um, so that will be coming up soon. Yay. I love seed buying time. All right, so last but not least, I told you guys I would go over some particular seed companies um, that grow desert specific or desert adapted or heat adapted seeds. And I highly, highly recommend you check them out. I do buy from these companies sometimes. They can be a little bit pricier. They're a bit more boutique. Um, in regards to a seed company, but absolutely worth it. I've had success with several varieties from these seed companies because I'm actually, I've actually purchased seeds from these companies and then I'll go into depth about the companies when I do my seed haul. Um, but for now, let me just list them. All right guys, well that is it. Those are my favorite vegetable varieties for my desert garden. This is not an all-inclusive list. This is a short and sweet list of my tried and true varieties for you. And it does absolutely not necessarily mean it's gonna translate to your garden. Everyone has a different microclimate, different location, humidity levels, elevation, wind, all this stuff goes into how plants are going to grow in your garden. So that's why experimentation is absolutely vital because as much as I hate to say it, because I'm doing YouTube videos and I encourage you to watch them, but you can't get all your information from a YouTube video. There's a certain amount of information you can glean before you just have to go out and try it yourself. So I highly encourage you to try this yourself, either the varieties I've shown you, or if you find something you like on one of those websites, just get out there and throw some seeds in the ground. And if it doesn't work well, Next year, you won't use that seed packet, and that's totally okay. <laughs> um, I will list all these seed companies that I mentioned today down below. You are also more than welcome to go back to my previous seed haul videos. I have all of those companies listed below, etc., etc. 
And then join me back here in one to two weeks. I don't know when I'm gonna get my seed shipment in. Um, but one to two weeks, we will have a 2024 garden seed haul video and some tips on how to save money with seed shopping. Thank you guys, and I will catch you on the next one.